Hey everybody, I, uh, I get the great pleasure of uh, introducing Hank here. And, um, I was really hoping for a bigger crowd and I'm so glad that, Kamarin, I'm so glad you are videotaping this because they'll be sorry what they missed. But at least we'll get it out there. Um, when, I, when we talk about uh, uh, helping uh, the developing world and, and things like, like Brighter Brains and the Kasese and, and putting humanism out there, I, I am always reminded of uh, something Christopher Hitchens said in, in several of his uh, different debates and uh, the words have kind of stuck in my mind has much to do with tonight's topic and he would say if you truly want to rid the developing world of poverty that cure has a name and its name is the empowerment of women if you give women some control over the rate at which they produce take them off the animal cycle of reproduction to which nature and some religions and religious doctrine condemns them. Throw in a handful of seeds and maybe a little bit of credit. You can't help but raise the floor. Everything in that village, the optimism, health care, will go up. It will, it will get better. And these are very humanistic ideas. And tonight you'll hear about these ideas put into practice in places such as the uh, school we support, uh, the Kasese Humanist primary school started by uh, Robert uh, Musabaho in, uh, in Kasese, Uganda. And um, you'll probably see, there is, a, there is a picture of Bogar John, I think, and uh, the, young, the young man that we, uh, that we sponsor there. Um, so one of the people at the forefront of this is, of course, our guest, Hank Pellicer. Hank is the founder and director of the Brighter Brains Institute, a California nonprofit that builds and converts and supports humanist schools, clinics, and orphanages in Western Uganda. He's the author of, of the book, Brighter Brains, 225 Ways to, injure, to Elevate and Injure the IQ, and he writes about brain development on, on the educational web, website, greatschools.org. He's also written columns and articles for salon.com and New York Times. His latest book uh, that is out, and this is this is a web book uh, right it's now? An e yeah. It's an e-book, um, which is The Birth of Bezoha and the, wor the World's First Conception, pardon me, and Birth of Bezoha, the World's First Atheist Orphanage, which I have to shirt. Um, <laughs> Hank was Managing Director of the Think Tank at the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies, where he wrote 90 essays on futurism, transhumanism, and organized a cell phone drive for Madagascar cattle ranchers and I saw the YouTube video on that, that was really interesting. Um, as, as an events organizer, he's produced over 50 comedy shows, 10 conferences, five solo performances, two shows, two debates, two political fundraisers, and four art and performance festivals. He's started, in, started two preschools with a sister school in the Philippines that aided the... Mangyan. Yeah. Actually, my brother helped me with this pronunciation. I still screw, I still screwed up. Tribe in in Mindanao or Mindoro Island. He's always lived in California, except for one recent year. Him and his wife and two daughters spent in the cloud forest of Costa Rica. He has a BA in history, an MA in humanities, and with an emphasis on religious studies. It is my great pleasure to introduce Hank Pelche. Pelche. Um, yeah, we've got more shirts, like the one Pat's wearing, if anybody wants to buy a shirt. How much? It's only $10, and I'll take it in Canadian dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we also have, look at this, uh, yeah, I, pr I produced an atheist film festival in San Francisco years ago, we have, this is one of the only two remaining t-shirts. <laughs> and what else do we have? You can have some of uh, this information here, and you can have that as well. So, I have a... Um, a little thing, and uh, how do I work this? I, I just, just to the forward, no, to the sides of the forward. Sorry. Oh, okay. Right to the forward. Okay. Um, okay. Here we go. Brighter Brains Institute. Uh, yes, like it was like like uh, Pat already said. It's we're a nonprofit in uh, in California. <laughs> And I'm going to explain, uh, we're humanist missionaries in Uganda, I'm going to explain 
the humanism that we do there is perhaps a little different than, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm going to call it African humanism. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever read uh, anything by Leo Igwe. He's on our board of directors. And Africa needs a certain kind of humanism that perhaps other places don't. So our, our humanism is mixed in with just a lot of uh, progressive kinds of ideas. But we'll get to that. OK, so let's start in. Uh, uh, we start, we've only been involved in Uganda for about two years. About two years. Two years ago, we had one humanist. Uh, we were helping one humanist school in Uganda, and today we're helping eleven. So what this presentation is really about is how do we go from helping one to helping eleven in two years? How do we go do that so quickly? And 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 the point I want to make is that Africa is totally ready for humanism if people want to you know get involved and, and help. Uh, I don't, I don't know the word other than convert, but persuade or encourage. People are totally willing to leave uh, the religions that they're involved in and become humanists. And, and the, how, how we particularly, how Brighter Brains has, a, has been successful is by offering material benefits, which is similar to what the religions do, but we also have a progressive philosophy, and they're very attracted to that. So the first one that we got, um, I'm going to talk about the material benefits a little bit. I find, I find this really interesting. As Pat mentioned, um, I studied uh, religious studies in graduate school. And the origins of religion are actually seeking powers that can manipulate the natural world. Uh, so and this is basic like superstition, basically looking for like spells or anything that can actually like get you food, that can get you uh, material benefits. So, um, and. And when I go to Uganda and when I talk to uh, Bwambale Robert Musubaho there, who's my primary contact, he says that Ugandans are very pragmatic. And what he means by that is that their belief system is not faith-based. They're looking to get something out of what they believe. They're looking to get material benefits. So they do a lot of church hopping. They go to one church for a while and pray, and if what they want doesn't come true, they switch over to another church. So basically what we do is what we offer we say, if you want to be a humanist, uh, you know, we're going to set up a clinic at your school and we're going to do this and this and that for you. So basically, whatever faith it has goes out the window and they're willing to like, you know, join us because actually instead of praying for, to get something, we're just saying, you know, we can, we can wire you this money in your bank account and you can have free medical care for all of your kids for the next year. So, uh, uh, so I, I find that kind of interesting. Uganda is an extremely religious country. The very first time I went there, I was amazed at how many times a day people would talk to me and they would say, uh, I will pray for that and it will come true. Like I would, they would say, how is your family? And I would say, my dad's very ill. And they, will, they would say, I will pray for your dad tonight and he will get well. So there's like this huge belief there and prayer, and people are constantly talking about prayer and how it's going to work for them. And so that's, uh, that's actually one of the things that Robert Musa, uh, Robert Musa Bajo is, is opposed, is trying to get people to, to stop praying, because people will actually, uh, instead of studying, they will like pray. Instead of like getting a book and reading it, they will pray. And so that kind of drives them crazy. OK, so let's move on. This, this to me is the most exciting thing that we're doing is that we're simply offering uh, a, a progressive philosophy and we've had a huge amount of success, particularly with women. Uh, one of the things that we promote is, is just tolerance and by that I mean uh, respecting other tribes, not hating other tribes. It's not well publicized outside of Africa and Uganda but there's an enormous amount of tribal hatred in Uganda which has 60 tribes and they actually do fight and kill each other still. You don't read about it because it doesn't flare up into giant wars, but it, it regularly there will, there will be like uh, intertribal conflicts and 5, 10, 15 people will, will be killed. So we, we teach tolerance and we also, of course, we support uh, gay rights. And of course, I, I think that's fairly well known that Uganda is one of the most gay-hating countries in the world. There's, there is very little um, support for gay rights there. But I think the most interesting thing we do there is we promote women's equality and a lot of, uh, a lot of issues that go around that. Um, we, uh, 
well, we condemn wife beating, which sounds kind of like, of course, but it's actually in Uganda, there's a, there's a lot of religious encouragement that it's okay to beat your wife. And so, but we come out and say, you know, it's, no, it's not okay. We've had uh, uh, women, we had one women's group join, uh, join us strictly for that reason. They said, you know, the, the name of that group was called the Matuma Women's Dignity Foundation. It was a nonprofit entirely set up to stop wife beating. And they uh, broke away from the Anglicans and joined us because uh, we condemn wife beating. <laughs> and also um, arranged marriage. Um, perhaps the, bi the single biggest thing that we promote is condom use. We have 12 clinics there and we give out free condoms. And this is, condom use is, discur is prohibited by both the Anglicans and the Catholics. We give out free condoms and we even give them to high school kids, which must drive them crazy. Uh, but that's something that we do. And, if, and, and condoms, it's not, it's not like we're promoting like sex. We're promoting like life and death because Uganda has like this huge AIDS rate. It's just like enormous. And without condoms, people are dying of AIDS. And, uh, and we also, uh, we also promote condoms because of birth control. Uh, Uganda has the, this, one of the highest fertility rates in the world. Its population has gone from 4 million in 1960 to 36 million today. They are headed for a catastrophe. They're the size of Wisconsin. It's not a big country. They've got 36 million people. The land is agricultural. They don't have anything else going on well, except agriculture. They're depleting the land. They're cutting down the forest. So we are promoting birth control. Uh, we also say, we also support uh, girls' education, women's equity and leadership. We condone divorce. Uh, and, um, and we provide something, they're called Afropads. I don't know if people are familiar with Afropads. This is one of our single most popular items. Afropads are, are simply reusable menstrual pads. That's all they are. They're washable and reusable. Uh, girls in Uganda cannot afford five disposable uh, maxi pads a month. They can't do it. So what they do is they stay home, they don't go to school, they drop out of school, they get pregnant at 13 or 14, and they're and that's it. They're just you know they don't get educated. But we what we do is we give we give girls Afro pads. It allows them to stay in school and to get educated. And that's one of our most popular. And in fact, we have uh, uh, women's uh, women-run schools that join us. They'll say, "We will become humanists if you give all the girls in our school <laughs> Afro pads." Simply that is enough. Uh, okay. So our first contact there was I don't know how many of you probably had the same experience I did, but one day I was just surfing the internet, looking for humanists and atheists around the world, and I suddenly found. On the other side of the world, Cassisi Humanist Primary School, and I was amazed that there was an atheist school in the middle of, of in, in Uganda, and this is like a rural part of Uganda. It's near the Congo border, and it also happened to be, I don't know if any of you have like a magic place in the world that you always wanted to go to. My magic place has always been the Ruanzori Mountains, also called the Mountains of the Moon, and they always kind of weirded me out because they're on the equator and they have glaciers, they have seven glaciers, and they have gorillas, and it just seemed like the weirdest place, to, and they have like a, a, a very unique uh, uh, kind of vegetation where it looks like giant, uh, giant ferns and cactus. Anyway, it's a place I always wanted to go to, so I decided that I was gonna connect with Cassisi Humanist Primary School because it was a place that I would like to go to. So I, you see I am actually a, a, a sort of selfish person. I like helping people that I actually want to go there and visit them. So, uh, and, and Bwambali Robert Musubaha was one of the best social media networkers that I know. He's all over Facebook. He's really easy to contact. He answers his email quickly. So we quickly became friends and uh, uh, a couple other things about him. It turns out he belongs to the Bakanzo tribe, which is, uh, I, I, I've ended up becoming fascinated by African tribes. There's hundreds of tribes. There's 60 in Uganda, and the Bakanzo tribe is, a, is an interesting one. So I'm going to show you. So anyway, here's his, um, he has 
he's been a fantastic networker. Uh, who he is is he was actually orphaned as a child, and then he was raised by his grandmother, and he got good grades, and he went off to college in in, uh, in Kampala, which is the capital of Uganda, and he got a degree in science, uh, biology, and he actually uh, is an entrepreneur. He started off, he learned, he worked his way through college by becoming by being a barber, and then he uh, opened up a couple of beauty salons, and then he bought some. Uh, uh, rental properties and rented them out and then he decided he was going to go back to his hometown which is Cassisi and then he decided uh, completely on his own uh, that he didn't believe in God anymore it was just like this uh, he did it all on his own it was just like this thought that there can't be a God this everybody's talking about God and and what they believe about God is really stupid and anyway and then he connected to the internet with the international uh, humanist and atheist uh, and he started his own organization which is called Cassisi United Humanist Association. He just started a humanist organization on his own, and he started a started a school. So I connected with him, and uh, I said, "We just want to start helping you." And I got my brother. I have a brother. This isn't me. This is my brother. I have a brother who is a great guy, a fabulous atheist, and extremely rich. The perfect, <laughs> the perfect brother. I have the brother, the brother from. Heaven, but that doesn't make sense. But a great brother, a wonderful brother, and we get along great. Anyway, so he supports a clinic there, and I'm just going to run through some of this stuff. Uh, the clinic is basically, you can run a clinic in Uganda for 200 kids, give them free medical care all year long, pay the medic $1,500 is the total cost. That's all it costs. You pay the medic $500 a year, that's the annual salary in rural Uganda and the thousand dollars covers all the medicine for all the kids. So free medical care for 200 plus kids. And anyway, they all get dewormed. I don't know if anybody knows about deworming. It's supposed to be the best thing you can do uh, in a developed world per dollar. I think it costs something like 50 cents a kid to deworm a kid per year. So she's like deworming all the kids. What else have we done there? Uh, I also have, a, I have the, greatest, uh, the greatest nephew in the world who is my brother's son. He's an extremely rich uh, pot grower in Santa Cruz Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's more of a headache than my brother. Uh, he's, a, just, he's, a, he's a bit of a character. But anyway, he's, he's, he's wealthy and he always has expendable cash. He, he's, he, can, he literally can call me and say stuff like, I have too much cash and I don't want to try to run in the car with it. Can I give you some for you gone? And so he comes over and he gives me like, Three thousand dollars in a shoebox, and we send it off. So anyway, he has started a creativity lab, uh, and basically he's supporting the uh, supporting the arts at the CC United Humanist School. So, um, and then um, we've also bought them all shoes. Ninety-five percent of the rural kids in Uganda don't wear shoes. They don't wear shoes. Um, it's just something that they just don't get the money for. So, but we give them shoes. This was a real successful program. We're going to talk about orphans a little bit. These are this is a we we did a uh, we did a campaign uh, where we got all these girls' dresses made out of kikoi cloth. Uh, it's fifteen dollars a dress. People are happy to buy these orphans. Some <coughs> now it's really you know you can talk and talk and talk about poverty, and then you get like I, I you know I know, I know that there's poverty, but when you get there you you get to see like oh this is what it's like. So we're talking about the average kid has. Uh, one set of clothes, and it's a filthy T-shirt, like 10 years old with holes in it, that his two older brothers had before him. And that's like all they have. So it's great to get these kids clothes, because they just don't have a lot. So what Robert does is he promotes the, the 10 humanist principles. These principles were written by a Canadian named Rodrigue Tremblay. Tremble. And he has a book called Global Ethics, The Ten Humanist Principles. Is anybody familiar with that book? For some bizarre reason, it's quirky. For some bizarre reason, the Ugandans have adopted it as the humanist book that they follow. And they love the book. And uh, so this is actually, we send this to all of the humanist schools that we work with and we make them put it on the wall. 
The book is actually excruciatingly boring, <laughs> yeah. painfully boring, and I'm rewriting it so that it makes sense to an African. So what we actually, what I'm, what I'm actually doing is I'm going through it chapter by chapter, and I rewrite it so that there's, and then I send lectures to the our, our humanist schools, and I say read the lectures to the kids, read the lectures to the parents, read the lectures to the teachers. And the lectures are they're, they're really fun to write. They, you have, I have to write in stuff that says stuff like, uh, if you farm on a river, it is not okay to pollute the river because it bothers the person downstream. So this is like really enjoyable for me, you know, passing on like ethics that actually are meaningful to them. Um, but out of, out of these, um, the only one of these really that's anti-religion is number six, no superstition. It's only one of the ten that says no is anti-religion. But that number six is driving the Anglicans crazy and the Catholics crazy. Mainly the Anglicans. Uh, what uh, uh, what Bombali Robert Musabajo goes through, um, he goes through stuff like, uh, I got a recent email from him, and he goes, ah, oh, the Anglicans are now saying that I have... Um, I am conspiring with the devil, and all of the children in my school are possessed by demons. So he has to he has to put up with this kind of stuff. And I mean, it's it's bad enough to hear that, but it's it's really problematic that people actually believe him. And we're going to talk more about superstition later. I, I can tell you right now, it's interesting that when I go to visit him, he wants he puts me in the car and he goes, let's just drive around, and he just wants to drive me around. He wants to drive me around and he'll be like, wave out the window. <laughs> wave at the kids. Okay, we're going by the, wave out the window. And I go, why do you want everybody to see you with me? And he goes, he goes, because people don't believe, I, people think I get money from the devil. I mean, not meaning, not meaning me. He goes, he goes, I want everybody to know that I know uh, white people, that I know Americans, that I know Europeans so that they know that I get money from you because otherwise they think I get money from like the devil or demons. I know, it's a completely medieval kind of belief. And we're going to talk about creepier stuff at the end because uh, there's like an anti-superstition campaign that he's working on. Okay, so I'm moving on to, uh, after helping uh, Bombali for a, a while with Cassisi, um, I talked him into thing, something. I have a, I, an e-book out that everybody's welcome to get. It's called uh, the Conception and Birth of Bezoha. So I was visiting him and I persuaded him to do something. I said, I said, I want to start the world's first atheist orphanage. I don't know if anybody has read stuff online like people, like in these arguments between atheists and Christians. The Christians will always go, but what good are atheists? Have you ever heard of an atheist, or atheist orphanage? <laughs> you haven't. You know what I mean? So I, I read a lot of that and I finally was getting pissed. I'm like... <laughs> It's true, there's no atheist orphanage. And I was like, why don't we just start one? So they can just <laughs> shut up about it. So, so I was talking, I tried to talk him into it. I go, let's start the world's first atheist orphanage. And, he's, and he kind of didn't get it. He's like, he goes, I have orphans at my school. I go, that's not good enough. We need an orphanage, an atheist orphanage. And then I said, I can raise money for it. And then he listened, okay? And so, and then I, and I had a, I had a friend at the time who was a, a really good, uh, promoter, a good, a good, pretty good, a fairly good writer, and a pretty and a really good promoter. And his name was Zoltan Isfahan, who, and he's actually running for president now on the Transhumanist Party ticket. Which is this is all kind of wacky, but that's anyway. But so, so I talked to Zoltan Isfahan about it, and he goes, "I can, I can make this work." He goes, "I'm going to write an article for Motherboard Vice, which is a fairly popular alternative website." He goes, I'm going to write an article on it, and it's going to be about the launching of the world's first atheist orphanage, and I'll raise you some money. And so together we worked on it, and I launched the GoFundMe as the article opened, and we raised $6,000 in 30 hours, and then we cut it off. And then uh, I opened up another site, and then we raised 10000 in two months. Anyway, it was plenty of money. It only cost $1,000 to build a classroom in Uganda. So we had, we had immediate, within 30 hours, we had more than enough money for the orphanage. And I was a little, a little bit like, Wambali, what are we going to do? We already have too much money for the orphanage. We figured the orphanage would cost like 4000 
you know, one dorm for the boys, one dorm for the girls, and then uh, another thousand dollars for the kitchen, and then three hundred for the latrine. What are we gonna do with the extra money? He goes, let's start an orphanage school. Let's start a whole school so that the orphans have a school to go to, and we'll also invite the neighborhood kids. So we kept at it, and uh, and we eventually raised about forty-five thousand uh, dollars to have this huge, uh, to have a big school. It's got like what did it say? It opened. It probably has two hundred pupils now. So now we have Bazoha Humanist Orphanage School. This is the orphans. Um, there's actually eight girls in this room. They sleep two to a bed, two, four, six, eight. So I was like, was, you know, the orphanage is not that big. Here's the school. There are happy kids at the school. And what else have we got going on there? We launched a book drive through an organization <coughs> called Scholastic Books. I think we've given them like 2,500. This was our biggest thing we got them. Uh, uh, a sponsor came to me who said, I want to give Bombali something, I don't know what to give him. She goes, but I read a book that said you should always just give people what they ask for. And I was a little bit like, oh, that sounds kind of crazy. But let's ask Bombali. And Bombali said, I want a tractor. She got him a tractor. It cost $7,000. I was actually opposed to it because I was like, $7,000, that's a lot. You know, that's seven buildings. You could do, we could start a whole other school for $7,000. But the tractor turned out to be a great Thing. He's renting out the tractor for $100 a day, which is a phenomenal amount of money. So he's basically got a self-sustaining school now uh, through this tractor. Now, I think, oh, and here's the Afropads. This is, this, is, this is just hysterical. There's actually just this massive uh, taboo against talking about menstruation in Uganda. But all these girls are just, they're just so happy they can't help it. So they just uh, wave their uh, Afropads. And we actually started another business. And I, was, uh, I got tired of buying Afropads, so we, we, got some, we got some sewing machines in there like making their own Afropads, which I think is going to be really fun. Okay, so this, is, this pertains to your organization. You guys support um, uh, an orphan. Um, I think I wrote down, let's see what the next slide is. There's a lot of different ways. Oh, here he is. Here he is. This is actually a film, but it's not rolling. So, sorry about that. But anyway, that's what he looks like, and he's got a cute little voice in the film. I think I got some, oh, this is, uh, we constantly do, we constantly do um, orphan sponsorships. Well, Bali Robert does it, like you guys got one. And uh, we ask like, why are they orphans? How did their parents die? And the list is, it's just so long, it's grim. There's a lot of AIDS, malaria, hepatitis, there's other diseases they die of too. One of them, Oddly enough, is anthrax. You know, people die of anthrax there, and it's because it's some it's some kind of like thing that grows. In, in, hippopotamus get anthrax, and then the hippopotamus die, and the Ugandans eat the hippopotamus, and they die. It's, it's this very strange thing. Anyway, there's considerable amount of uh, there's some murder, quite a bit of suicide, a lot of poaching. I don't know the whole story on the poaching. But I'll just get a note saying, this kid is orphaned, his dad died of poaching. And so I think it means they're right next to this giant national park, and, and people go in there to try to kill animals and eat them. So they either went in there to get an animal, and they were killed by another poacher, or they were killed by the, um, by the, um, the forest rangers. I don't know, but poaching is, anyway, there's also a hippopotamus, crocodile, Car accidents, floods, landslides, fires, uh, abandoned due to parents' imprisonment, abandoned due to poverty. Bojir John, uh, we don't know who his dad is, but his mother is apparently insane, so she's incapable of taking care of him. She's completely incapable. So he was taking care of, uh, of a woman. I think there that, is a game. Yeah. That one there is his, um, his first day when, what was her name, Kavista? Yeah, I'm gonna have I have a picture of her yeah. here. Yeah, but yeah. that's his first day at the orphanage, and uh -huh. I look at him there, and he is he he, he looks scared. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know what's gonna happen, mm -hmm. and um, I think he kind of looks smaller. Uh -huh. And then when you see him after a year, oh yeah, yeah, at Casese, yeah. um, too bad the video didn't work because he's one obviously very happy boy. Yeah. Well, the, the food thing there is really intense. The average uh, rural Ugandan kid gets one meal a day, 
and it's dinner, and so they don't get breakfast, and then they go to school, and they say that by af by afternoon they're they're incapable of learning. They're just hungry. They're, they're just, so a, a lot of what we try to do is to provide a, a free lunch for the kids, and all of Wambali's schools provide lunch for them. So it's it's possible that his He's eating twice as much as he used to. It's maybe even more. Uh, okay, so so after we raised, I don't know what it was, 40, 40 or five or 50,000, um, we decided that we would, um, first thing we decided was we were gonna build another one. Uh, we, we sort of were, we had some money kind of rolling in. So we decided to build another one at, at this other school, called, uh, at, this, at this other town that's only like a mile away. It's called Cahendera, and I think Ogier John might be from Cahendera because it's this absolutely appalling uh, community that's really near there. And I'm just going to show a few uh, photos of Cahendera. Cahendera is a completely uh, wretched uh, place. Here's some kids from Cahendera. So this is probably what Ogier John looked like before they took him over to the Zoha. And uh, this is, uh, like I said, it's only a thousand dollars. We we get people who just say, uh, I want to I want to name a building after me, or I want to name a building after my daughter, I want to name a building after my dad. And so they give us $1,000, and this shows a little bit of the process. So they can actually build these in about one month. It, it happens really quickly. And then they just build it, and I'm not sure what this is going to be. This is a clinic. And uh, the next picture, Bombali is a, a master of publicity. These are Kenyan, jur Kenyan journalists. We're doing like a, a TV show on the clinic. This is uh, the clinic at uh, Cahendero Nursery Humanist School. Okay, and that school opens uh, not too long ago. So after this, I was a little appalled uh, because we had raised so much money, and seriously, we had raised about sixty thousand dollars, and we were only taking care of about two hundred kids. And I and I thought that's a really um, that's crazy. We can't just keep building buildings and then putting a few, you know putting a hundred or two hundred kids in there I, I worked it out that that money that we that sixty thousand that we spent to take care of two hundred kids could have, could have provided six hundred thousand meals which works out to we could feed all the kids lunch at I think a hundred schools so I was thinking this is not a good way to go to keep building schools brick by brick so that's when I decided Let's see if we can just convert schools to humanism. Uh, because it's really, it's really not how much money you can raise, it's how much good you can do. And if you can do a lot of good without raising a lot of money, that's great. So we're really not focused on raising a ton of money. I'm, I'm, I think more about what can we do that, you know, that's effective, that's, you know, that isn't just raising money. So anyway, we, then we started to try to convert schools and we actually, that, that happened to be, that happened really quickly. Um, here's the first one that signed on to be humanist. This was a, this was a, a private school in uh, a nearby town called Charumba. They were, they were actually not associated with any church. They were, they were religious, because all Ugandans are, but they, were, they gave it up really quickly. And this is just a cute picture of the kids helping to build this classroom. This guy is actually, uh, this is a doctor who's actually um, given us money to build four classrooms. So, uh, and, and then we give them lunch food. Uh, unbelievable, their favorite food is rice. They think white rice is just...